Okay, we meet on stolen land. This is Lenape Hoking, the Lenape homeland. We look to the day that all indigenous nations' land claims are paid in full. As we're meeting on <laughs> environmental issues tonight, I just want to ask a couple of questions. I just wonder how many of you here might have read any part of the new UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report on the status of the oceans? Just raise your hand, even if you just read a news article about it. Cool. All right. The oceans report covers the impacts of carbon pollution on ocean, polar, and mountain ecosystems. And feedback, in order. And the human commodities that depend on them. Community, excuse me. Rrr. Long day. Part of that extra carbon in the atmosphere goes into ocean waters and makes the water more acidic. The acid directly impacts like shellfish growing their shells and coral. The acidity and the extra heated temperatures, which are much worse in the ocean already than in the air, and massive amounts of plastic trash made from petroleum are killing life in the oceans. But life on an ocean planet, it depends on life in the oceans, right? Now, how many of you might have read part of the August IPCC Climate and Land Use Report? It was the first one with the majority of its authors from developing countries, the first one to rely on interviews with indigenous populations as a key source. Just raise your hand if you read part of the August report. Okay. Um, that report covered destruction of land and habitat by agriculture, logging, mining, drilling, and it covered the point of view of people first impacted by global heating. The report said, quote, based on indigenous and local knowledge, climate change is affecting food security and dry lands, particularly those in Africa and high mountain regions of Asia and South America, unquote. I guarantee you that Many of the youth, even children, are reading these reports. So if anyone here hasn't been keeping up with the news on global heating, the youth have left you behind. It's time to catch up. Comrades, deforestation and environmental devastation started in North and South America and in Africa with colonialism and the arrogant thieving mentality that came with it of man over nature. The settlers started a war with nature in these lands. In fact, Europe's massive shipbuilding phase to go forth and steal leveled swaths of European forests. Modern scholars now estimate indigenous populations pre-invasion here at between 50 and 100 million people, but by 1800, less than 1 million native people remained in what's now U.S. current borders, threatened by 15 million European settlers. And the native people's population collapse led to immediate imbalances with other species, such as game animals and invasive flora and fauna. Why? because indigenous culture centered living in balance with the natural world and centered stewardship of the forests and lands. Before 1492, what's today the U.S. had about a billion acres of forests. Since 1600, some 286 million acres were destroyed, and that might be a low estimate. In a 1763 letter, Benjamin Franklin wrote, cleared land absorbs more heat and melt snow quicker. Oh gee, what a genius. <laughs> that he and Jefferson and the settlers were focused on rapidly taking down the forest is well documented in their writings. By the early 1800s, settlers had cleared a 100 mile swath from what's Maine to jo what's now Georgia with one half to three quarters of the forest in the area cleared. Settlers regarded these lands and resources as plunder to abuse. It was not long before the soil fertility was damaged. Then lands were abandoned and they move on to steal more lands from native nations. 80% of Earth's land animals and plants live in forests. Even taking out a part of a forest insulating canopy like they did during the Vietnam War in Vietnam damages habitats and causes temperature swings harmful to plants and animals. And rainforests are also key to water supplies and clean air. Between 1990 and 2016, we lost another 502,000 square miles of Earth's forests. Comrades and friends, colonialism fueled capitalism's growth. Colonialism and the growth of capitalism have deforested the world. This is a big part of the crisis of global warming. In addition to the massive ongoing increases of carbon in the atmosphere, the forests that draw carbon back out of the atmosphere have been destroyed. The world needs reforestation. Take it from someone who's been suffering eco-grief for many, many years. I'm bringing you a message of hope as a member of the 50th Venceremos Brigade. I witnessed Cuba doing what the world needs to do. 
After the 1959 revolution, Cuba implemented its first agrarian reform. Cuban reforestation began in 1968 in the Sierra del Rosario region with support from the revolutionary government when local villagers decided on a plan to start reforesting. The area had been totally denuded during Spanish colonization. The original forest was cut down for livestock and plantations. The indigenous trees, mahogany, magua, cedar, ebony, and others entirely wiped out. By the mid-1800s, the soil was degraded and deforestation continued into the early 1900s. The impoverished rural people were working for ranchers or they burned trees to make charcoal to sell. By the time of the revolution, there was nothing left there but isolated palm trees in, the, in that whole mountain region. Socialist Cuba saw a need to implement social and economic projects in rural areas, and this reforestation plan, launched along with establishment of community services and livelihoods, targeted improving soil quality and providing important work for the area's people. They used a terrace planting system on the mountain slopes. The plan began with an initial 5,000 hectares or 12,355 acres in the eastern part of the mountain range. The Cuban scientists assisted to determine which indigenous trees they should plant and the villagers started uh, with 3,000 mahogany, hibiscus, and teak trees. But within eight years, the rural people in the valley had planted six million trees. In 1971, they, found it, they founded their village of Las Terrazas, or the Terraces. The revolutionary Cuban government stated fruit trees should also be planted among the other trees in order to feed the people. Over 80% of the food eaten in the biosphere is locally grown, all of it's organic, including bananas, pumpkins, grapefruit, avocados, oranges, mandarin, mamey, all grown between the forest trees. When the Cuban people restored these forests, the indigenous mammals, plants, birds, and insects, many of which had become endangered during centuries of colonialist and capitalist environmental exploitation, they began to come back. The indigenous ecosystems began to be restored. Today, Cuba has 131 species of birds, 26 indigenous. The rest pass through a migratory routes to their nesting areas in Cuba. And 33 species of reptiles, including 17 kinds of snakes and 11 lizards. Some of the world's tiniest mammal species are from Cuba, and they were highly endangered. And the Hutia conga and Hutia carabali, which are rodents that live in trees, return to the forest, and it is believed also the tiny endangered Cuban selenodon. In 1985, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, recognized this reforestation project, and in conjunction with the Cuban government, added 25,000 more hectares, or 61,776 acres of the Sierra del Rosario as the first biosphere reserve in Cuba. Now, during the special period, not too long after that, after the loss of the USSR and Cuba's other former socialist trading partners, there was revolutionary support to promote ecological and cultural tourism with a doubled focus on sustainability. Also, beginning with the special period, it became mandatory to grow organic. Local villagers then restored a coffee plantation from one of the ruins of the colonial ones and planted coffee trees and started to harvest shade-grown Arabica coffee. And honey is also locally produced. Beekeeping is widely practiced now. My subgroup of the brigade visited Las Terrazas just July 28th, two months ago. We were joined by a local guide, Ida, at the village, and then she took us to the Rio San Juan. The river is fed by sulfur springs, so it's regarded as a mineral treatment. And Las Terrazas and this river are really popular for the workers in Havana to vacation on holiday, and we were there during the national holidays. So we joined the many Cubans swimming in the river and enjoying the forests. And their village was built with piped water, power schools, daycare centers, family doctors, dentists, a clinic lab, and a pharmacy. And from the beginning, scientific workers, public service providers, and artists joined the local people, and the project greatly improved the conditions for all the local people. People do raise some livestock to provide meat, and there's a man-made lake with fish farming. They have had some solar power, and they plan to acquire more when it becomes possible for them to do so. So the village later did add an eco-museum, a cinema, and a disco, as Cubans are renowned for their love of cinema and music. And they later decided to use the tourism profits to build a library. Las Terrazas became the model in Cuba for another 11 reforestation projects. 
UNESCO officially recognizes the Cuban reforestation programs for, quote, principles of incorporating knowledge and traditional practices to strengthen community involvement in strategic planning, unquote. And UNESCO's recognized five more Cuban biospheres to date. The Sierra del Rosario Biosphere has regulations of conservation. The community, organized in the local Committee for the Defense of the Revolution, or CDR, makes all decisions regarding sustainability, such as limits on further building and housing. The other reforestation, all 11 of them, the communities meet periodically at Las Terrazas to exchange indigenous seeds to promote biodiversity, and they trade produce. Las Terrazas has three green gardens of its own, which support the schools and community as the source of most of their food and provide for seven eco-restaurants in the park. The villagers grow fruit and flowers and plants with medicinal uses to make herbal infusions and they make their own vitamins. Kindergarten children even have their own garden. They eat their own produce at lunch and snack times. The children even learn to make herbal infusions with various flowers like chamomile and guava, the guayaba fruit. Our guide, Ida, told us, when I tell you it was mandatory to grow everything we needed, it was not because someone came and told us to do it. We need to do it, and we grow organic all the time. Some, some 7 million indigenous trees have now been planted in, in the 50 years since, and great biodiversity recovered. With over 800 species of plants, scientific specialists search for species of plants and animals in the forest daily, and twice a week they work with the local students to teach them. Even small children can recognize six or seven of the local indigenous plants. Our guide spoke to us about the impact of global heating on Cuba's growing seasons and the local flora. Some varieties of plants have now disappeared from the forest due to the heat, but others are in season earlier and longer, like mangoes. This July was the warmest ever recorded in the world. Ida told us that the, in the past, the average year-round temperature in Cuba had been 24 to 25 Celsius, which is 75 to 77 Fahrenheit. But this year, they had a new high of 39.8, which is 103.64 Fahrenheit. And you know they have humidity worse than ours, right? Ida said the reforestation plan was focused on the environment from the beginning. She said when she was a child before the revolution, the rains were so intense there that children were forced to sometimes stay home from school for a week or two. And now there are seasonal rains that might last three days. The people of Las Terrazas, yes, they live a rural life, one enriched by living in a peaceful, beautiful forest, but it's a cultural life very different from rural life in most capitalist countries. Beyond free health care, education, involvement of the community in all decision making, focus on science and sustainability, and organic food. Like all Cubans, they're focused on their music and arts. So in addition to the local mus musicians, one, the late Polo Montañas became world famous. Every June, Las Terrazas hosts a five-day music festival in his tribute, attended by Cu people from all over Cuba and other countries. This village has a very enhanced cultural life for 1,017 people. Now, in the last couple years, the villagers began to organize work to clean plastic and trash out of the rivers. And there are other communities in that biosphere, but that's the number of people that live in that one town. When foreign tourists and some vacationing Cubans have littered, children are invited to join this work to clean up the trash that tourists leave. And in this way, their environmental consciousness is developed from a young age. Their CDR is currently discussing the need to limit the numbers of tourists in order to protect the environment as a matter of sustainable limits. Now, what city in the US ever discusses sustainability? What corporation ever took that into its planning around mineral or fossil fuel extraction projects? None of them. They've left huge collection pools of poisoned waters near shutdown mines in the Rocky Mountains that kill flocks of migratory birds. From the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska in the Arctic to the BP spill in the Gulf, they never clean up their devastations of lands and waters. Life pays that penalty. Animals, plants, and humans. Capitalism treats 
our Earth's lands, waters, and air as commodities to sell, exploit, damage to use as a dumping ground. We need a rapid transition away from the use of fossil fuels to stop global heating, but capitalism won't stop its war on nature. Capitalism is not going to stop adding to the damages to the atmosphere, oceans, and lands. U.S. presidents have been getting briefings on greenhouse gases since LBJ in 1965, and Big Oil knew these risks decades earlier. Today, more than 80% of Americans live in urban areas physically and mentally removed from relations with what remains of our forests. By the way, the forests that are on the western native reservations in this country are in better shape than U.S. national forests, despite only one-third the funding. Native forests are considered by forestry experts now to be better cared for and in better condition. Yet, with global heating, there's now a longer fire season and much hotter, faster wildfires. Indigenous nations, however, are focused on sustaining ecological function across the lands. All native forests and parks are on stolen native lands. The European colonialist worldview of man over nature should be seen as superstitious and anti-science. All resource planning needs to become holistic. This is what forestry scientists say they have learned from working with native forestry programs. The needs of the forests, the ecosystems must be protected. Capitalism isn't sustainable. Comrades, it's the death economy. It's the death culture. By its very nature, it cannot be made environmentally sustainable. For those of you maybe new to environmentalism, when we speak of sustainability, we're talking about the biosphere of life on Earth, and there is no planet B. Big oil needs to be nationalized and expropriated, and the infrastructure rebuilt as needed to move toward a sustainable living future. And we will need to win scientists to a working class socialist program. We need their abilities to help judge the best practices to transition away from fossil fuels most rapidly. Instead of personal choices, we need central planning that enables communities and nations to make collective choices like Cuba does. Stopping global warming also requires reforestation. Forests do more than clean the air of carbon. They protect soil, water, air, biodiversity, and provide livelihoods. Despite decades under the illegal U.S. blockade, Cuba's done 50 years of reforestation work. Cuba protects its endangered species and works to restore indigenous ecosystems. Cuba only grows organic. Despite proximity to Florida, her coral reefs are in much healthier condition than Florida's. Cuba's socialist planning centers sustainability and enables the Cuban people to do all this. Revolutionary Cuba, despite the economic aggressions of imperialism, is a model for fighting global warming. Like Fidel said, and like the Zapatistas say, another world is possible. Maniwi Choni, water is life. Cuba see, bloqueo no. Cuba see, bloqueo no. Cuba see, bloqueo no. Again, about the climate and the environment, I do really do believe this is the fight of our lives because capitalism is a war with nature. And humans are also in nature. Um, I'm going to give you a term you can use, and I would encourage all the comrades when they go about your daily lives and you have conversations with youth about political issues, start talking about the environment with them and the climate. And let's, let's name ourselves what we are. We're eco-socialists, okay? So use the term. And we want to talk about Cuba to the youth and everywhere we go. Cuba's been recognized by the UN and the World Wildlife Foundation as the most sustainable country on Earth. And it's because they have central planning, because they have a Marxist-Leninist government, they had a revolution. And they'll be the first to tell you they've got more work to do. You know, and they're held back by the aggression of the imperialists and by the blockade. But look at what they've done despite that so far.